and welcome everybody. My name is Lily Hall and I work as a curator here at the showroom. And it's um, a real pleasure to welcome you to this online, online event, which is both the opening of Compost, Catherine Baum turning the heap at the showroom, and the launch of Past Journal's 13th issue on the question of exhibition. Joining from the showroom today are myself and Catherine Baum, and from South London, director Elvira Diangani OC. Joining from PASS are editors Joyti Mystery, Nick Akins, and Mick Wilson. The open format of the Zoom room today is to enable everyone to be present together online rather than just having the speakers visible. But, so please feel free to have your camera either on or off throughout. Um, however, please do take care to remain muted, otherwise we'll hear your volume into the main Zoom screen. The event is also being live streamed on YouTube for those who are not with us here in the Zoom room. We are, I think, a full house, or approximately so, so any others will be yeah, following us on, on YouTube. Um, the event is also being recorded and will be available on both the showroom and the past websites in the future, as well as the new compost website, which has gone live today and is designed by an endless supply. So many of you will already know Catherine Baum, but by way of very brief introduction, Catherine is a London-based artist working internationally whose practice focuses on the collective reproduction of public space, economy as public realm, and the everyday as a starting point for culture. In 2020, Catherine stopped starting new projects and is currently composting what she has produced as an artist so far in order to make fertilizer for evolving long-term infrastructures. So those include Company Drinks, the Center for Plausible Economies, and the Rural School of Economics. PASS is an online artistic research publishing platform at the Faculty of Fine Applied and Performing Arts at the University of Gothenburg. So just a few words about the format of the next hour and a half together. I'll shortly hand over to Joyti and Nick, who are going to be giving us an introduction in a performative way, as we understand, to past journal and to this new issue on the question of exhibition. We're then going to have a short five minute break um, for a Zoom, Zoom rest, in which we'll be live streaming back to the radio station NTS that was playing perhaps when you arrived in the room earlier. We'll then reconvene here at the showroom and Catherine is going to give a live walkthrough of compost in the space. And she'll be doing that from her phone, so she'll move, you'll follow her around, around the exhibition space. And she'll be explaining the processes of piling up, filing and fertilising that will be taking place over the coming six weeks here at the showroom, both in the gallery and online. So Elvira will then explore the exhibition and its modes of usership in relation to institution building. And she'll then pass over finally to Mick Wilson, who's going to reflect on Catherine's exhibitionary strategies. If you have questions, then please feel free to post those either in the Zoom chat, or if you're joining on YouTube, you can also post them in the, in the YouTube chat. But um, please, could you be sure to address them to the person who you'd like to respond to, just add their name before the question, and we'll be collating those, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. We'll read them aloud back to the speakers for those who they should be addressed to. Um, and then we're going to finish by opening up the Zoom room and pinning the camera on this live feed to the showroom, and then we'll be unmuting so it's possible for everyone to, to communicate who's in the room, not just those of us who are speaking at this time. So now I'm really happy to hand over to Joyti and Nick. Thanks so, thanks so much, Lily, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to say a few words and then introduce uh, my co-editor on this project, in this particular case, Mick Akins, even though they are two other co-editors, Mick Wilson and Charles Camino. My name is Jyoti Mistry. I'm professor in film at HDK Varland, University of Gothenburg, and the current editor-in-chief of PASS, which is a research platform for artistic research that brings artistic practices in direct conversation with discursive, theoretical, and critical scholarship across different disciplines, 
in an interdisciplinary approach and through international collaborations, this opportunity being one of them. Haas holds a conference every two years on a focused area that draws from creative, artistic and research practices from varied disciplines in the humanities, social sciences and the empirical sciences. In November of this year, PASS will hold its biennial conference on the topic of violence from the 17th to the 19th of November. This is a hybrid conference that has five focus areas, aesthetics, environment, embodiment, materiality, state, and, cu and, a, and a special curated strand. Uh, we have invited numerous uh, um, contributions from the Open Call, so I look forward to you visiting us on our website, uh, www.passjournalonline, and uh, there you will see the list of the confirmed plenary speakers. I'd like to take a few minutes to just offer a few thank yous before I turn over to Nick Akins, who will offer a framework of the special issue on the question of exhibition. I'd like to thank Rose Brander, PASS coordinator, and all the contributors of this part of the issue on the question of exhibition. The forthcoming parts will be launched at the end of summer 2021 and early autumn 2021. Particular thanks to the entire team at Showroom and special thanks to Lily Hall and Catherine Baum for the generous opportunity to have a joint event and to Mick Wilson for facilitating the introduction. Nick Akins will describe briefly the broad framework of the issue on the question of exhibition and then we will turn jointly uh, our attention to the breadth of the content of part one that we are launching today. We will end this session of the launch with a reading of a conversation that is included in this special issue that brings us towards the opening and the celebration of compost at the showroom. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Jyoti. <clears throat> And thank you to, to Lily, to Catherine, to Elvira and everyone at the showroom. Um, this issue of PASS is titled On the Question of Exhibition. Um, as editors, five research frames have guided the selection of contributions. Firstly, our aim was to mine competing ontological and epistemological conceptions of exhibition. Secondly, to consider the exhibition as research action, research object, and research site. Thirdly, to identify the translations and relays of exhibition within online and algorithmic domains, something we're doing live in action today. Fourthly, the interchanges between exhibition and extant expanded practices, another theme for today. Lastly, and framing all of these questions, was the manner in which political imaginaries are at work within different constructions and operations of exhibition. To turn then to the contents of part one. Exhibition as writing, Samia Henny. Exhibition as writing alludes to the way in which exhibition produces forms of writing that are not possible within a publication. Conversely, she writes, the form of writing that the various iterations of the exhibition have produced in the exhibition spaces cannot be expressed and transmitted through the writing of this text. This issue of PASS gathers largely textual contributions and is perhaps counterintuitive. Writing essays on exhibitions is, as Henny summarizes, not the exhibition itself. Exhibition is speaking, Anthony Gardner. Strip away the discourse so that the matter just speaks for itself or speaks in a way that it wants to speak. It is simply the presentation of the thing. It could be something that has a more spiritual resonance. It could be something that has different resonant materialities. Exhibition is compulsive storytelling, Russia Salty. We try to tell complete stories, or at least we have the, those that have the least amount of gaps possible. In other words, we are compelled by a sense of duty, and we were compulsive by nature. Exhibition as publishing. Stephen Merkadon invites a reconsideration of the exhibition as an expansion of the fashion ma magazine, a form in which the con contributions of photographers, designers, and stylists coexisted in much the same way as they do on the page. 
we're shown as exhibition document that through the selection of a number of fragments reconstructed a history of publishing, thereby underlining the need to preserve its traces. Exhibition as plot, Lisa Rosendahl, poised in the middle between the idea of sight and the idea of a narrative, a plot is a sequence of events as well as a spatial designation. If a theme is an overriding message determined already at the outset of a story, a plot is rather that a message is played out over time through actions and events. Exhibition as trace. Jessica Vericchio. Our aim was to recover the traces, to make them visible, to give importance to what has been left behind in the footnotes of history, and to be attentive to what lies underneath supposedly neutral images and discourses. And beneath that siren are the traces of suffocated women. Exhibition as control. Elena Claire Feltman. Possession of the aquarium and acts of maintaining an entire microcosm reflects greater colonial projects of control because it allows for all the Western bourgeois hobbyists to extract and sustain exotic life. Exhibition as ubiquitous. Dave Beach differentiates between the ubiquity of shop window displays, media events, public information announcements, pedagogical situations, activist events and other forms of display. Exhibition as composting. As curator Gavin Wade begins the discussion, composting is an invitation to consider the idea of place, connecting it to the social space in which things come together. The compost heap needs to accumulate in one place. It needs time. It needs to create its own ecology. It needs worms. It needs layers. An excerpt from composting. Francisca Zolion. The garden house was also a shop where you could buy products from my villages. You could also eat and drink there. You could meet people. Whenever there were encounters or encounters in this space, it was not necessarily always clear who was in which position, as artist, as host, as audience, etc. What was important about the space also was there was a countertop, as in a bar or a shop, a space of encounter for the trading of values. This was also a very subtle and playful exercise in all those things that institutions do and frame and formalise. However, it was done in this very generous and friendly manner, so that you could ask questions about the commodities for sale, you could ask your way around the show. Many things could happen there. It was set up so there was no specific expect expectation on you to act in one particular way or another. It might be parents with their small children who came to buy orange marmalade made by Spanish nun nuns, something they may, have, they may have discovered once in the garden and then kept returning. There were also people who came to collect the many different items produced from my villages and available for purchase during the show. The simple infrastructure of the countertop and the vending machines created many different situations. Therefore, it was an important decision not to work with my villages in the white cube, in the formal exhibition spaces that we have, and rather to use the informality of the garden and the hut and this simple spatial device of the shop counter. Mick Wilson. This brings us very clearly to the critical spatial practice aspects of the work. The way Katrin's practice often operates as architecture by other means. Typically, when people talk about the exhibition as a spatial practice, they often point to the set of internal relations set up within the space of exhibition. Whereas it seems that when Katrin is talking about exhibition as a spatial operation, her account extends far beyond the immediate local site of exhibition. Gavin Wade. This is what I've been trying to indicate earlier in describing Katrin's facility with exhibition making. In my interpretation, exhibition is making things functioning in a space in a way that enables social encounters and other activities to happen. This is part of the fundamentals of exhibition. The iceberg image that Catherine uses is very useful here. In exhibition, you see often one bit of what is going on. However, there's also this other stuff under the surface, which allows that bit to happen and to appear. 
Katrin's practice is very good at attending to that other typically submerged material and process. Beyond the gallery is perhaps another metaphor for this. Francisca Zollion. Robert Fillier has this quote where he says something like, art is what makes life more interesting than art. When we talk about the physical exhibition space as a physical container, one of the problems is that it, is that it becomes unrelated to context. Now what we as institutions try to do, as Gavin describes it, is get back into the context. Catherine brings context into the exhibition space. She uses the space not for individual production, but brings in the context of people working together, interacting with each other, not understanding each other, but collaborating nonetheless. Yolanda Zola Zoli van der Heide. It seems that the key term is precisely one of collaboration. I'm thinking about, for want of a better phrase, what can we achieve working together in difference? I'm reminded of what the artist Ola Hassarsson says about spatial discourses being often attached to state ideologies and the need to work outside the state-centered discourse. I suppose that Catherine proposes to operate in a similar way with respect to gallery space and to exceed or decenter the spatial logics typically inscribed in art exhibitions. To operate in terms of commoning, say, as opposed to the typical neoliberal propriety terms within which we often find ourselves gridded. In this way, there is a proposition as to what is happening at large and a testing of alternatives as a means of being in the exhibition space. On the question of exhibition, part one includes contributions by Dave Beach, Catherine Vaughan, Elena Claire Feldman, Samia Henny, Saul Merkadent, Lisa Rosenthal and Jessica Vericcio, and roundtables with Rasha Salty, Nick Akins, myself, Christine Curry and Anthony Gardner, and with Yolandi Zola, uh, Zola Zoli van der Heide, Gavin Wade, Mick Wilson and Fris Francisca Zoliom. I'd like to take a moment to um, return to an important opportunity and recognize Steve Madoff's important contribution in talking about exhibition space as a context for friendship. And I think that's a beautiful way in which to round off the space and to invite you to go to the PASS online journal and an opportunity to see the contributions made. I'd like to invite everyone to a five minute break and then we will return to the showroom and see the exhibition. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Um, for anyone who wasn't with us earlier, just to let you know, we're here in the showroom at Compost, Catherine Baum Turning the Heap. And I'm now going to hand over to Catherine, who's going to give us a tour through the, the space. Hiya. I quickly say hello. Can you hear me? Um, I'm turning around. Nothing here is made by myself. Everything in the space is made by many. I don't know who's in a Zoom meeting. I don't know who's watching on YouTube. Um, I know that there are close colleagues, close friends, close collaborators, and I want to thank you all. Um, I'm nervous. I've never done a live streaming. I'm going to walk around compost um, to explain why and how and what for. I've marked my tour with numbers to not get lost. But made by many is the starting point. Walking over to number two. Compost, you might wonder why, why in a gallery, why an exhibition 
why bringing this stuff to the showroom? I wanted the attention of art to think about the work. I think art is important, not special. There's a desire to dissolve things, to arrange things, to get rid of things, to prepare. It's also my relationship with the gallery. Mick Wilson knows from the interview that I, I, I don't consider myself as an artist producing towards exhibition, but actually have, have done rather more than I thought when I went through the inventory. So there's a connection, of course, there's a connection. There's a close connection to all the colleagues, collaborators, friends, allies who work in museums and art galleries. There's a close connection to the showroom who's been an amazing independent art space in London, my hometown. And we've worked together several times and we always seem to open in the week of the 20th of June. I want to go to a book. There's books here. Everything that's here is what I had at my studio. Compost is also a moment to think about the function of the studio. A certain frustration with the studio just being storage and a place for central administration. Everything is here, it's piled up. It's being reorganized with others, read, discussed, redistributed. An important book I'm focusing here now is by Doina Petrescu and Kim Trogel. The so Social Reproduction of Architecture. And it's, it's a book close to my heart because it talks about the attempt to create spaces, to create structures in which we can do things together. And when they launched the book in London at the Phytology Garden, it reminded me of this very simple um, rule that, of course, everything you do subverts or supports something. And it's very simple, it's very clear and still how to remind yourselves. So I guess some of you who know my work, the work is done with others, my villages, public works, company drinks, haystacks. It's a practice that's often described as socially engaged. It's a practice that's seen as in process. It's a practice that's seen as project by project, you go somewhere, you do something local, localized with others. Well, I guess over the years, a lot of those works, this kind of production of space became a reproduction of things. And I think that's when I realized that I wanna stop, I wanna stop this mode of producing another project. I posted this post, I sound far too serious. No, I actually find all of this quite funny. <laughs> anyway, did those posters a few years ago, don't wanna do another project, I wanna make a pile. And that's closely connected to what Doina and Kim talk about, of course, the idea that trying to reproduce, trying to use the energy, trying to use the, the values, the energy, the friends, the resources, everything you have to support systems and to think about the sustainable reproduction. So I don't wanna make a pile became compost. And I'm, I'm not sure how more often I can say this word without <laughs> cracking. It's, it's gonna come back to me. It's like gonna be a running joke, Catherine Boom turning the heap. And I wanna send, I send my big thank you to Rosalie Schweiker who donated this title. Um, this compost tape is actually on papers that were used in the first showroom show in 2001, so somehow this compost has been around longer than I thought. Um, I have to find my next point. I'm going to number, sorry, lost in a pile. I, also, I know I look like a pilot, I'm not. Um, the compost was to pile up and that's what we're doing the next six weeks. That's what I'm hoping. I think it will take longer. It's, uh, of course, it's an ongoing, an ongoing thing to make compost and fertilize that you value. But in the gallery, the things are here. They're piled up, they're pulled out for different discussions. Um, they're being discussed in terms of what should survive, what, what might rot, what don't we wanna put on the pile, what will come out of it for future use. 
And here's one of the folders that I think that's already a distillation from the process, I think. And I talked to a lot of artists at the moment. We are quite tired of organizations who like to shine with radical ideas, but continue a shit practice. So that's the idea of reproduction, of um, a social reproduction of architecture that we actually use the values to run the organizations, to organize the relationships, to set up the infrastructures as we want them. So compost, and I, I find this so bizarre. There are some people watching me in the space and I, anyway, I keep going. I focus, I focus, I focus. There's objects and there's process. Most of my work is process-based. The object is not always important. It's important in the moment when it embodies a collective process, when it reminds us of what doing things together means. So we are pulling material, the objects, from the different areas, the book, the books that are here, the posters that are here, the boxes of printed matter, archiving, all sorts of different projects. I can see public works, um, something with Nicolene von Haars come, a lot of work with my villages. Um, we are slowly pulling this material out in order to use it for discussions and for the past magazine. Um, the exhibitions there were inventoried and we are now kind of slowly adding them to the database in a random order. So if you look at this um, pile on the website at the moment, we are digitizing with the objects in the space in relation to who the conversations about the work are with. So exhibition was first. I quickly go to another table. And I think Babke is here tonight with my very close colleague, Babke Feenstra. We're looking on Thursday at all the works, objects that are in London from work we did as my villages. And again, composting will be a moment to think about what to keep, where to keep it, and what to use in the future, what for. So there's very different moments um, of pulling things out in relation to conversations with colleagues, collaborators. Here we pulled out a very classical archive box. I nicked this idea from Celine Fondarelli, my very dear studio mate. Um, and it was something I did at the showroom a few years ago, working with a provider of few services. We did shops. We did, I didn't remember that I only saw it when I dug out the box. We did a shop next to the International Village Shop, which again is elsewhere in the exhibition here. So as you can see, and I maybe start boring everyone with what I'm doing, but there's incredible um, depth of what happened in the past. And the value to this will not be given simply because I can remember it or I value it, but all those things will be dug out during compost together and then see where things go and what of those practices we want to continue. Um, there's art, there's lots of posters, lots of posters. Some of them are fancy decoration. I like making fancy collages, but they can also be framed. If you wish, that is up to you. Um, I'm following my tour tape. I have to be very careful not to switch into like a Tupperware selling mode. There's another pile. I think maybe I'd, it's, it's another um, pulling out material to discuss what to do with it. And that's with Keep It Complex. We'll have an internal meeting here with the material around us deciding how we dissolve as a group and where our material goes and who should be able to use it in the future or who would want to use it in the future. Um, da -dum, da -dum. I'm just looking for my next number, number nine. 
Compost is to dissolve the materiality of things in the space through reuse. Some of the tables might go to company drinks. One moment of reusing and redistributing is of course trade, something that runs across a lot of work, be it the international village shop, trade show, company drinks. So we're using different trading systems throughout compost to redistribute and dissolve the materiality. For example, the very famous period plans we did with Keep It Complex, drinks by company drinks, vases I made in remembrance of the idiots in my home village. Um, and there's also catalog, a publication done with the communal knowledge project at the showroom a few years ago. Um, company drinks is here. The one-to-one -one is something that gets talked about in the past magazine. Working on the scale of the topics that are being addressed. So talk about economy, run a business, run it differently. Art on the scale of life. And I finish with a quote which uh, is used a lot by Stephen Wright and handed over to me through by Kuba Schreder. And it's about the one-to-one -one and compost being exhibition on the scale of a compost in a gallery. It refers to a story by Lewis Carroll, a group of farmers deciding on what scale to work. And they discuss, we very soon got to six yards to the mile. Then we tried hundred yards to the mile. And ca then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. It has never been spread out yet. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So now we use the country itself as its own map. And I assure you, it does nearly as well. I would like to thank you, the showroom and PASS for making space for this one-to-one, -one, for the incredible collaboration and support to allow an exhibition to be quite messy and not quite formed when it opens to dissolve in its being. There's Lily, Elvira, Sima upstairs. Mick, thank you very much for the trust and the space you're giving to this. Um, and I would like to finish um, just briefly by saying I'm here. I'm here the next weeks. Um, if anyone would like to meet up, pull out something, criticize something, chuck away something, um, please get in touch and we can meet here or via Zoom and go through the pile. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, this is absolutely great. And as you were mentioning, Zoom, here I am uh, from, uh, from South London. I'm so sorry not being able to be with you guys, um, opening up this fabulous project. Um, I always think uh, your work is see the, the exhibition. Um, and in a way, as somebody was reminding us earlier, uh, Nick and um, and Yoti, uh, that you bring the context to the exhibition and you bring the exhibition to the scale. But I wanted to recover one of your um, one, one of your responses so to to the conversation uh, that parse the number present to us on the question of exhibition. Right when you talk about compost, to you say uh, it's not a random pile. 
-hmm. It's a layering of particular ingredients. Mm -hmm. Composting also has this aspect of duration with often shared work over a period of time. You pile compost together or add on to the same shared pile. Composting is also a kind of partly predictable, though not fully determined, way of transforming one thing into something else. So I formulate the idea, and this is you, uh, to do a composting of work today in some kind of real time process to see what will rot out of things accumulated across the arc of my practice. This entails constructing different inventories and considering the various ways in which a work and its material trace, traces may be grounded, grouped, ordered, or rearticulated. And I feel that both this sense of duration, layering and accumulation over time that is critical to your practice is also crucial to understanding the relationship that not only you have established with us in order to produce the project now, but also to consider the relationship that you had established with the institution over time, no? over decades, as you were mentioning earlier. And I'm going to share a little bit of a um, Trip to memory line. I hope you don't mind. Some of the things that we have seen already in the in the image are there. Um, but as I was saying, um, this this sense of duration and this sense of not wanting to uh, continue to operate in the scale uh, that you have been, uh, what that entails. But in order to to talk a little bit about that, I thought that it would uh, make sense to. Uh, to go through some of the work that you have produced with us over time in 2001, as you said, probably in June uh, 20, um, you produced the work a millions and millions and millions and millions that for those of you who, um, those of us uh, that uh, know your practice, I know also that uh, it continues to be your uh, website. Um, then there you created, as we can see here, this incredible room scale collage consisting in a mix of enjoying uh, things, right? Uh, changing the space, sharing a visual loss, a sense of visual loss, creating this room scale collage, as I was saying, containing prints, posters, stencils, photographs that occupy the gallery along um, with the loosely arranged furniture that you also made. Uh, the second project, and you show us some images, and I can uh, wait to to be in the space and, and being able to um, to see them in person. Uh, some of the some of the images that the project uh, beat on pipe. Uh, I'm a shop. Um, I am a shop. I'm a, I am shop. Sorry, um, that you developed in 2012 uh, with our colleagues, with Shelley and, and with Pethys as part of the communal knowledge program at the time. And that included this collaboration with uh, PIP, uh, which reads um, Pursuing Independent Path, uh, working with them over a period of five months. And, and we are hoping that some of the conversations that you develop with PIP uh, will also come up um, as part of the, of the project that you are developing with us um, at the showroom, with all of us. And the project uh, that took then uh, the shape of, uh, of an experience uh, in which people was invited to print sketchbooks, uh, work on ideas, outcomes of workshops were launched, a new mobile dispenser were tested in the Charles Street market, some of which um, we have seen in the images that you have shown uh, in the space. All of these ideas, and thinking about um, possibilities of, of, of models of tradings and shop within contemporary art practice. Uh, so this, this, uh, this working one-to-one, -one, as you said, is a long process working on the scale uh, of life is also something that you have been addressing for quite some time. And we are excited that we can continue to do this with you. Um, Perhaps one of the key issues um, that um, the people that have already entered compost that Catherine Bone that info uh, have already experienced is also the principle of transparency that had been critical in your practice, uh, fundamental to the economic, social, and material process of the planning of this show, both the compost but also is 
realization in the publicness of the showroom. Um, and it's this open format that we call uh, exhibition in use that we uh, that has enabled the the the, the collation of uh, body of work, your body of work for the past. 23 years, um, but also through the methodology, uh, the past context, and, and is offered to the audience, as um, Lily and you were saying earlier, to help us to reflect, to turn in the hub, uh, the hip, sorry, and at the same time consider, as you were discussing, what is, um, what is to be produced as a fertilizer for the future. No? And this is a reality that is open as it happens in some other occasions in which you present your practice open to everybody. Here we see you in the presentation of this is no longer the place. Um, but what, what it is important for us is also that equally constitute a shared process to redefining institution building at our organization. If we take your artistic approach, your exhibition making and uh, processes and, and the models of sustainability that you endure as methods of inquiry, we have a new understanding of usership as opposed to spectatorship, which is also uh, somewhere in a poster that we can see uh, in the background. Um, these this, uh, circumstances that lead to this one-to-one -one with the institution as well uh, offer um, the possibility to all of us to become user. But what kind of usership these processes you are inviting us to conceive, to uh, generate, to um, augment, uh, provoke, right? And if we, each of us is a user of these activities, piling up, reviewing, archiving, socializing, reading, or simply being in the space, right? How this will determine, determine augment, or change in nature of the exhibition in use and your work itself over time. I think uh, another critical question for you is the sense of uh, collective ownership and the, and the source of publicness that this connection uh, with Compos will establish. I think there is some, some kind of background. Um, is that in the space? All right, I, I'm going to continue. And just to, just to say that, um, that of course, there is, there is something that will be revealed and you have mentioned a little bit throughout the presentation and the tour through the show, which is this idea of the solution that we are inclined to consider as well, like how to, uh, that will take place the last week of, the, of compost. Um, but then we want to understand and we want to pose this question to with our colleagues and all the people that hopefully will become a collaborator and a, and a composters as at some point as Sima Manchanda, our managing director, uh, mentioned. Uh, so what is it? What, is, what are the circumstances? Uh, what this solution means in this context and under which in this circumstances will take place? and which new conditions will emerge from such processes, right? What are the possibilities of the showroom as an institution to germinate new modes of sustainability in dialogue with uh, the, let's say, the inquiry that your modes of practice invite us to reflect upon? But I wanna say that as you were mentioning earlier, uh, composting is a word made by many, and that is um, that, that the process throughout uh, up until now has been registered um, but, uh, but our, our colleagues, Lee Hall, Simon Manchanda, but also particularly but Dan Vale, who a photographer with whom we have been collaborating for quite some time. Um, also that the, uh, the hybrid, the, this new uh, hybrid sitting shelving structures have been designed for use on site through the conversations that Catherine had established with both the curatorial team, but also with artists Adam Schill and Elliot Denny. And, and also uh, subsequently built by Schill and Denny and with the collaboration and final uh, finishing touches by Paulina Michoska. Uh, almost all the material used has been repurposed for those that were, um, from those projects that were uh, 
you know, that we have for I don't know how many years sometimes at the back of the of the our store room um, and until May this year and 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 then many of the past installations that you perhaps even see there um, part of those material has been reorganized. As um, uh, Lily was saying at the very beginning, we are in collaboration with two uh, entities. One is the designers of Anandis Supplies who are helping us to develop this, um, uh, the digital space uh, in, by which you will be able to enter at any point in the exhibition, uh, but also to attend either to one-to-ones or to, um, you know, get connected with some of the myriads of events that uh, Kathleen is going to be involved in. So I will recommend you to check that. Um, we, of course, uh, have always um, uh, come with Andy Jenkins when it comes to uh, our um, AV material and he's helping us today and will help us to bring activities uh, of the showroom online um, for you all to enjoy. Um, perhaps the last partnership, which also have been mentioned earlier, is, um, is to Art360 Foundation, who are also uh, collaborating with us. Uh, from here, we want to send our uh, love to Francis Wural Campbell, who uh, can no longer be our archivist these days, but we uh, also want to welcome Laura, who unfortunately, I completely forgot your last name. <laughs> and uh, so I apologize, maybe um, uh, Lily can give me a hand later on. But it is of course a lot of people that is going to be accompanying um, uh, um, Catherine in the space. Um, apart from all those I have mentioned, our colleagues, uh, Carson, Arthur, Vanya Canyon, and Masha Dinani, uh, Kathleen Walker-Stewart, Campbell McConnell, and Una Damir and Corey Dem Demby McGowan. Uh, also us, all of us, um, Sima, Lily, and I, and hopefully many of you. Uh, and the idea, as Catherine was saying, is that we will do this gesture of compiling, archiving, being in the space, being together uh, in the space. So without further uh, um, uh, ado or uh, other talks, I'd like to invite uh, Mild Wilson to join us uh, for the conversation. And, and again, thank you so much, um, Catherine, for coming uh, to the space with your folder and starting to, almost as it was, uh, like the, I would say the, the sort of like the old school version of uh, augmented reality, uh, bringing with all these posters, trying to already em envision and imagining what this political attempt to take hold of the space of the exhibition. Even I will say, not for me, it's always, uh, I will say that you exceed the exhibition um, uh, uh, format, no? Each and every time, like that, almost that it feels that for your practice, an exhibition is not enough. There is always something other that is, uh, but the exhibition is the condition for it. So, with those words, I I lead you guys with uh, Mig Wilson, and I urge you to uh, get into even right to access to the space um, book just locked. See you later. Bye. Thank you very much Alvera. thank you for also the the willingness to experiment in the relationship around how the conversation evolved with Catherine and with Paris and it's been really it's it's been a great experience to work in this way which I think it's something about Catherine's charismatic agency that she tangles us all into different constellations and collectivities and relationships and she she has a, an incredible an incredible agency and i i mentioned that because i think it's it's one of those aspects of the discussions of expanded practice that often is occluded that in the in placing the emphasis on questions of shared authorship or the, the displacement of authorship, I, I think there still is room for us to pay attention to 
the particular types of agency. And I, I, I think this is something that I don't just attach to particular um, individuals like Catherine, but also to institutional processes and spaces. And I think that there's clearly something in the kind of institutional agency of the showroom. And I, I, I think that's suggested not just in the layers of relationship with Catherine's practice, but um, in the way you unfolded the, the dynamic of the process of working with Catherine and the way in which the, this question of the exhibition is unfolding in the space of the pandemic, etc. But we're not we're not simply jumping into these default settings of of simply relaying and transposing content online. And I think this is a really I, I think I, I think it's an important thing that the showroom is doing in this working relationship with Catherine is um, really putting some serious thought into the change circumstances of exhibition making and the way in which exhibition making can be, um, I think this is a phrase that you've used previously, Alvira, where you talk about an operation being done on the institution as well as by the institution. Um, I, I was, um, I thought it might be useful to just mention a, a little bit of the context out of which this uh, conversation with Catherine evolved from the issue that we were doing on the question of exhibition in Paris. And it, it, one of the things that we, we had kind of noticed in thinking about exhibition was that while there has been a massive expansion in terms of the formats, the tropes, the figures that are used within contemporary art practice, within the expanded field of the curatorial, that the exhibition still seems to be the primary mechanism through which art is valorized. And, and I think that um, that's, that's an important an important kind of condition still, that the exhibition is the primary mechanism through which art is valorized as art. And uh, one of the things that we were wondering about is, well, how does that, how does that unfold in the context of these expanded practices, which are, you know, in the US, they would use the shorthand social practice. In other contexts, people will talk about participation, other people will talk about the social turn or socially engaged practice and so forth. Um, I think all of those terms are, you know, they have their shortfalls, but basically pointing to those practices that have an expanded um, aspect and that are not primarily characterized by the production of um, objects for display or the production of spectacle as such, and and that operate through other modes. And that one of the problems is that there still is this tendency to valorize art through exhibition, so that these practices are always being somehow problematized in their moment of translation to exhibition. And what actually happened when we started to look into concrete examples, and Catherine's is the first here, but there are others that we consider in subsequent parts of the issue. But it, it, what begins to emerge is that actually exhibition was still an important operation within these practices. And I guess what we're seeing today is that the operation of exhibition has been extended, rethought, recalibrated, reconceptualized within these practices. Um, and that the kind of the dominance of uh, my fellow countryman's uh, Brian O'Doherty, the dominance of his 1970s reading of the White Cube as the kind of default rhetoric with which to do an analysis of the uh, the exhibition it actually we need to we need to move on and we need to re basically recalibrate the analysis to start to take account of the concrete specifics of how exhibition operates in a many different 
practices within many different institutional settings and within different different projects and not not in the yeah in different programs as it were um, and i'm thinking here that within in the conversation that we have with catherine and this analysis that she develops about what it is that characterizes those moments in the operation of exhibition that seem most to honor or to be congruent with the terms of the practice. And she talks about this one to one scale, which she already mentioned there. And an aspect of that that I think is really important is this idea that the exhibition is not about something, but the exhibition is the site where something is being done. So we don't have an exhibition about trade. We have an exhibition which is a process of trade, which is an aggregation of multiple layers of trading. And in this instance with the compost um, show, I think it's really remarkable that the process of exhibition is being used as part of a process of public review of the practice. And I think um, this is something that we don't actually unpack in the conversation, but it's something that really struck me as Catherine was walking us through the exhibition space today, is that the act of critique is folded into the practice in this process of public review, where the arc of the practice is, and its various traces, is being sifted through in this really painstaking and multi-layered and with multiple intersecting networks and collectives, this, this sifting through of the practice, but within the kind of tricky, the tricky light of publicness. And I think there's such a really delicate operation of courting a public process of critical reflection that does not succumb or slip into a mere courting of publicity. And I think this is really such a delicate operation. And uh, there's something about the ways in which uh, Catherine walked us through that space that I was struck by this orchestration of forms of publicness, forms of visibility that somehow still avoid simply being subordinated to the demand for publicity and visibility at any cost. And I think this is something that I, I, I think a part of it does come back to the willingness of Catherine and her collaborators to do the processing, this, this other aspect that comes out of the making of decisions publicly. And, and I think there's, that's a, such a key element of this composting process that the decisioning, this key, this is kept, this goes, this is, that that process is unfolding with a kind of level of public scrutiny or visibility. And, and the kind of arbitrariness of the conversations that might unfold, the contingency of who happens to decide to take up the Zoom invite or who happens to take the, the opportunity to go to the space and sit and talk to Catherine there. I, I, I think there's something really, really important about the willingness to enter into those contingent, accidental arising um, relationships. And I, I think in a way it's kind of the antithesis of social media, it's the antithesis of friending it's it's the it's the risk of actual encounter um without uh, without a fully resolved formula or social formula to get us through the encounter but i was hoping not to spend all this time talking but rather to solicit some responses from catherine and um i guess one of the one of the <laughs> questions i would have is do you not have some hesitation or some caution about this kind of disclosure of all the nuts and bolts, all the 
all the traces, all the all the things that accumulate in the studio. Like, is is do do is there? Um, yeah, I suppose to what degree are there moments of reticence? To what degree is there a behind the scenes process? Uh, it, you know, as, as the, I suppose the staging and how you think about this. Thanks, Meg. Does it work? Okay, I hear my own echo. Um, you have to turn on the mic, I think. Can you hear me? No? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, it's a dilemma. But I think it's a dilemma that has been uh, very explicit in the work for a long time, you know, like where does the informal end and where does the f formalizing, the making public start? And um, of course I'm forcing certain issues, like, you know, I'm, I think um, economics are important, you know, to look at how we finance, what are the economic underpinnings of the works we're doing. I think it's really good to have transparency there. The idea of a transparent budget um, is key in order to reorganize budgets and demand for budget. So there, there's certain like, kind of key principles where I'm like, okay, that's, that's, my, my, that's one of the main interests. Um, when it comes to filling this transparency with information, it's, it's the delicate act. Um, where does the information come from? And it has to be disclosed that it's not just me making something public, there has to be an agreement on the publicness of this information. Um, so there will be, of course, moments throughout compost, and they're, they're kind of being discussed, which are not going to be made public because who I meet or the group that meets doesn't, doesn't want the publicness for what it's trying to dissolve in the space. So it is those individual kind of agreements over, do we turn on the Zoom, do we kind of um, perform, do we allow the random to happen, but they are, they are decided step by step, person by person. And I think even with the, with the showroom and that's, um, you know, of course we have said yes, we will reveal the budget, but I think then it will be also discussion around what's, what do we want to achieve with that, you know, what, it will always illustrate something. So the, the transparency is never a single decision by me, it comes out of a conversation, how we want to use this together to make use of the publicness of what we reveal, um, if that makes sense. But it's it's a it's a one to one, and I think it's something that in the practice has always been the case. You know, like you can't work very informally with others and then reveal it all. You know, like disclose what they've told you um, in a very private, um, intimate uh, situation. I think there's ethics around protecting the the intimacy of this of this conversation, but because the publicness of compost, it. it I think no one will come here and mis mistake this for my living room. You know, it's, it's a public situation, like it's almost a given condition um, for what's happening here. So that's why the gallery space is really important for also thinking about how the informal and the formal can come together. Whereas, um, but it's always this kind of decision, um, protecting and respecting what the other person doesn't want to reveal however interesting I, I would find it. But it's always, it has to be a mutual decision on what, what becomes transparent. Ideally with a mutual goal around changing the economy around funding ours. I, mean, I, th I think there's, I mean, there's always such clarity and precision in the way you think about the operations that you undertake. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in the I guess it's it's in the the kind of critical discourses that are often elaborated in response to um, to these practices, which I you know these expanded practices. And for example, I think your proposition in relation to the question of economy and trading that that you know there is a, there is a public sphere within economy. And there is a, a whole spectrum of economy that is not reducible nor determinable simply by an analysis of capital. And 
I think that, that, that when you engage with these processes of economy, of circulation, of trading, it kind of triggers these knee-jerk critiques in relation to, you know, the, the accusations of neoliberalism, you know, sponsoring enterprise and entrepreneurship, etc. But I am interested in um, the way in which you you seem to be enfolding processes of critique into the practice as it unfolds. So I'm just wondering, I mean, it's a long winded way of leading into a very simple question about how, what is your relationship with the process of critique? Is it always through a kind of self critique or a critique that you kind of engineer within the practice or just just your thoughts on this question of a relationship with processes of critique and criticism? Well, as thinking things in the making, I think that's, that's the relationship. You know, there's not a thought process that then results in practice. It's always simultaneous. Um, and again, I think it's always in, um, in relationship. You know, it's my critique towards myself, critique by others. Um, but it's also the practice has always been driven by certain practicality, you know, to like, do something to make the compost. You know, I could have dwelled on this compost idea for another three years, but I think there's something about the actuality of then trying to resolve it through practice, where the thinking remains, organizing it while it's done. Um, that's that's the relationship. Um, but I think um, c compost is not it's not to confirm. It's not necessarily confirm things. You know, there's like like when I talk about economics, I can I can give quite easy. Like, you no, know, I, I don't want to confirm thinking so far here continuously, um, there is moments to also be really critical about the wording I use, the way I organize my own thinking. And maybe to give an example, um, Grace, Grace Dietrichu, who's a, who's a close colleague, she works a lot with um, eco economy or as, a, as an artistic practice. So we are close colleagues. We're gonna have a conversation around the categories I normally use to think of the economies behind my work and compare them to hers and maybe see whether I'm missing something with mine, whether her ideas of conceptualizing would make sense for me. So it's, it's, it's in, that, that would be kind of a, that wouldn't be like a cr process of someone critiquing what I'm doing, but like comparing critical thinking around a topic and allowing each other to use each other's ideas. Um, like I normally, break the economic underpinnings down in the kind of the, the financial ones, the quantifiables and the non-quantifiables. Um, Grace talks about time, money and spirituality. Um, so I think it's also a moment to allow conversations, co colleagues to reshape some of the wording, the thinking. I don't know, but I might give up certain things in, in this process. Um, I hopefully will give up certain things in the process of composting. Um, and it's also like, it's the more acute issues that come up also during the show and, and in this time, you know, this question of like complicity within art economies, which um, we're gonna have a talk with Catherine Gibson next week around the, the idea of interdependence. But again, it's a kind of critical thinking that thrives towards um, practice, that thrives towards actually doing something with that knowledge. And if I can take you to another, Thing that I would just like to hear you expand on because I, I think I'm, I think I get it, but I, I would be interested just to hear your walk through it. One of the things that you're kind of letting go of, and I think it, you, you announced it at the very start. Uh, that's, that's the signal for me to shut up, is it? Um, one of the things, that I'll, I'll, this is the last thing, but one of the things that you announced to start letting go of is the kind of project, the project kind of machine the, the, and this, this will to work within these longer term infrastructures like the company drinks, the Center for Plausible Economies, 
the, the rural kind of self schools. Um, but I'm just wondering about the, the, I guess, how how complete is that move away from the from the project to the long term durational infrastructure? Because I'm, I'm wondering if maybe there still is a space for the the kind of the yeah for the project in some in some other yeah in some revised form or whatever but just your thoughts on the the, the move away from the project form to infrastructure that was obviously a catchy slo slogan as well no? to say <laughs> yeah so, so sorry for that but it it uh, it rings the tone with a lot of colleagues you know everyone's like yeah i like just i of course, it's a critique of this neoliberal idea of like you commission someone to deliver something and the next thing. And I think um, like having worked with like with my villages over, over a very long period of time, even though we've done a lot of different projects, they, they feed into one practice. And I think Elvira, when we had those early conversations, it was about this is about organization building. You know, that this is not random that we stick with topics over a long time that we um, keep using the same ethics and practices. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a building up of a quite a maybe very informal but an organizational structure that's the idea of like the reproduction of, of social architecture you know that's the making of spaces in which we have maybe more control over how things are done um so of course um the project is a is a, is a uh, the re rejecting the project is to like get out of this treadmill of like finding the next project but also like being able to to say it you know you, can, you know when decisions become art you can quite easily say to a curator no i don't want to do another project i i, I actually want you to support me in a practice I want to continue, you know, like, so I think it's also about breaking a cycle of how things have to be portioned and categorized. So it's, it's of course a rhetoric game, um, but it's also a very practical step towards, well, if I want, don't want to do it, I can say it, and maybe there's another way forward. Um, so, uh, of course, it's a slogan to provoke something, but I think it is this very kind of practical moment of saying, I don't want to do a project, I'd rather um, feed invitations into supporting and sustaining those more long-term um, and ongoing infra architectures, however you want to call it. And so it became a game around words. But I think this refusal to say, yes, I'll do another project, which then will be unique to your curatorial status. I think it's this meeting around ethics and practices where we, if we get rid, rid of this kind of packaging of smaller parcels, we'll actually realize how big our shared practice is together. You know, it's a massive, massive, um, space that we we, we, we we all share once we get rid of this kind of packaging it into into small small things thank you and um, just before you go to the audience questions just to say thank you to the showroom and thank you Catherine for in enfolding us into all of this thank you Mick no thank you to Mick and um, also like we're, to say there's the start now of an ongoing process towards the publication, which we haven't talked much about today, but um, there'll be a series of editorial meetings that are happening regularly. And maybe this speaks to a question around maintenance, perhaps, that's come up, because I know together with Catherine and with Paul O'Neill as well, you were thinking about how to start to join us in, in the space and how to start having these conversations about the, what, what the publication what the form might be or how the methodologies that have come together here then carry through into the way that you approach the book. And so that will be a, like a weekly conversation, um, which maybe somehow talk to this idea of a, like that shift towards like to kind of ongoing practice rather than the one like waiting till after we finish this project of an exhibition. Um, but maybe it's a good moment because what we've been doing in this kind of analog digital switch is gathering the questions that have been coming through from people either via YouTube or in the chat. And, um, and then the team upstairs have been bringing them and writing them on these note cards. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just pick a few and, and raise those to each of, um, yeah, each, everyone who's contributed this evening. Um, but maybe we can start with, with Catherine. Um, and the first question that I have here is around the studio practice and the process of shifting or bringing everything from the studio and elsewhere here to the, 
to the showroom and whether you could elaborate on your interest in composting as a moment of thinking through the studio practices very process. Something around the shift from the studio to, hmm. to the showroom. Is it on? Yeah. Um, again, I can, I can think a lot <laughs> by myself. Um, the, the, the conversation around this, I'm not sure if Celine is in the sumac. I can't see all the names. I will be with Celine here in the space. You know, we've been Celine Condorelli. Celine Condorelli. We've been sharing a studio for a long time, very long time, um, and we both know what we value about sharing studios with others. Um, but I think that's when the when suddenly I I, I take the right to. To, to be I, you know, I want to move out of the studio. I don't want to move out of the studio, I want to change the function of the studio. And that's where, why Catherine Boom is mentioned with compost and that we all want to make compost because I also have to recognize that it's my desire, you know, it's my wish. I, it's my desire at this moment in time to not continue a studio that, and again, I think it's something a lot of my colleagues feel becomes pretty much a space for administration. Um, and then again, you know, um, I cannot like that and continue it or disrupt it. And I'm not even sure if I'm going to find a better solution, but I think it's this disruptive moment. Um, to not think of it as um, getting rid of, but maybe thinking of it, what, 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 I mean, I know it already, but I would like to leave it to the conversation with Celine here, here in the showroom. But how would I rather use the studio? And I think a lot, a lot of those things have to do with resources, access to resources. Do I really want to use the resource shared studio as a kind of administrative place? Actually not. I would like to use it more as a kind of social and shareable space for making use of this, of this resource. Um, so, and I just, don't like it if things are sh sitting in a shell for 10 years, you know, like I get it out, like if I can't remember it, I just like that process of not just leaving things at this point and I, and I mean those who, who know me well, I'm like, it, it's a mess, you know, I constantly work on far too many things in parallel, sometimes bordering the careless, um, but I think this moment of taking things out of the studio was also to like, make time for caring about what I've actually done and um, not in a kind of egotistical way but just wondering if there's things that I'd forgotten about or I want to take further. It's, it's about taking time and, and looking at things, yeah. Uh -huh. Which makes me think of the process that you'll be working on together with Laura, Laura Caligaro, who's going to be archiving together with, with you here in the space um, and this process of thinking through the kind of taxonomies or categories or the ways of reorganizing and thinking about like self-archiving in a way or, like that's been and the other day we were talking about suddenly the realization that you needed to add yourself as one of the kind yeah, of yeah, nodes of relation but also this idea of like you, you know writing yourself into the text we were talking about Helen Sixou and talking about like the woman must write herself into the text and the relationship of like the individual in relation to the collective and the naming of yourself or like of the position of the eye whilst your practice is so collaborative but the importance of that not to kind of make to continue to or not to not to maintain a kind of invisibility of the individual within the collective yeah um but maybe something around the process at the moment of really devising this archival approach or the categories that's very live and happening in the space with laura it's a big pile that's all i can say at the moment like it's just also funny um, because of course every box you open you're like oh my god but that's not the point it's not the point of reconstructing everything it's it's a point of composting I think because it's such a volume that will happen at some point it doesn't have to happen at the start you know not all decisions have to be made now um, but a certain si yeah I stopped well, it's something that you can tune in to via the Compost web website that's now live. Um, and the, 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 the we'll be posting the link um, to, the, to the chat. But, um, so you'll be able to see it kind of accumulating over, over the next six weeks as a starting point. But um, I'll just sift through now to a question to, well, the two questions to Mick. Um, the first one is whether you think that this same 
process could be achieved in private, and maybe that's something that you were speaking to about this, the relationship between the publicness of, the, the, of doing, doing this, of composting in public in relation to the private. So could something equivalent be achieved in private? Or, and also how we can create alternative ways of valuing art other than in the gallery space. I think maybe Catherine is in a better position to answer the, the first question about the publicness or privateness of this. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, Mick, it was you who suggested a few years ago we do a book about my practice. And that post that existed already, but to edit the practice with the modes of the practice in public, in use and collaboratively, for me was a very um, clear way forward. Instead of like leaving the, the leaving stuff in cupboards, leaving things on hard drives, and then then edit it. So I mean that's not something we, we've spoken about much today. But the, the composting is of course an editorial process um, to create fertilizer, and one form of fertilizer will be this book. You know, it's it's, it's editing things down to what do you want to take forward? Um, so this in public, and that was a conversation with Gavin Wade ages ago. I was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, just, 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 just use the methods of your work to, to do this thing, to look back at your work in public, in collaboration, and in use. So that's, that's what you said earlier. That's the one-to-one, -one, you know, to keep the methods of the practice to uh, pr produce the next step, to produce the next thing. So it, no, in private, I don't even know what that would mean. No, I've never done stuff for private in private. I mean, my work is so fundamentally about being in public, public time, you know, shaping public space, keeping the complexity of publicness. So no, in private, nah. Okay, so thanks for that one. And this is a question to Elvira, maybe the showroom at large. Um, around it's saying seeing as social art or socially engaged art processes are the very are very importance of wait let's see the writing of this handwriting <laughs> social art and the very importance of social practices is at the heart of the showroom um how challenging has this process of curating been during this difficult time so i guess that's around yeah what, like i guess we've been programming a certain amount online and yet thinking about something we have been talking a lot around compost as well as those uh, is digital accessibility um and not there's not an assumption that in any <laughs> context you can always tune in online and that's very much the case around the showroom but um it's going to be something we're going to be talking through in compost but elvira what are your thoughts um yeah i mean th there was something that uh, that i think was me or somebody was saying earlier no like how to how to remain uh, inventive uh, with the model and, and yet to be to keep the idiosyncrasy of the space no? and and the reflection to do this uh, today with pars online and I cannot even attend my own meeting for these circumstances my own opening so like the, the possibility of having access that way the possibility of engaging in a dialogue that way no? and, and the very same I, I think is also something that we decided as a team long ago when we uh, had to close the first time, no? like how we will engage. Um, and I think we discussed also this with, with you, Catherine, at the beginning, no? how to engage with the circumstances. No? Because one thing that we didn't want to do is to just simply follow rules, but to incorporate those rules into the mechanism and the nature of the practice of the artist. So then if we were to deal with uh, condition of closure or a, the impossibility of, of, of access to certain individuals, we will make that possible. No? So I think this span on, on what you were saying earlier, me, no? that's something that happened to the institution as well, no? and, and how certain processes that are critical to Catherine's practice already are embedded in the way that we, we are hoping to, together with her, deliver this in public. No? But, but it's, mainly, it's mainly to play something that I always say that one cannot fight the architecture uh, that is embedded in, 
it has to, you have to transform you have to accept the context and then transform it but if you if you critically go to the story to begin with without using the mechanism of that without subverting those mechanisms you you don't get to uh, fully understand the architecture that you need to dismantle and but the dismantling occurs and occurs in that way and with Catherine the the possibility is to do that. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, Catherine, and I'm going to jump on my question here while I'm talking is, is this idea, no? because we talk about dismantling also, uh, you can you can uh, leave, no? the, the refusal of the project is also for us an opportunity to think about exhibition making as the instituting gesture to, to rethink about, uh, to rethink the institution and institution building in general, no? and, and this is the, what you uh, offer us. But one thing that I mentioned at the end, but I, we, we didn't know much and we won't know much until the last, the very last week, but I wonder if you can jump and elaborate it for us, is this, this issue of the, the dissolution, no? because all these moments of practices that get you to, uh, from the studio to the showroom, um, are hoping to dissolve somehow later on uh, into something else, right? Either is in the swap of the work, of the sale of the work, of the sale of the installation, of the sale of the methodologies or the practices, right? Like the dissolution and what that implies in, in terms of the, uh, the collective and the collaborative project that you have ambition for us are important, no? Like, so how, you know, moving uh, from this sense of like working with the times also, the timely questions about how dissolving your project um, also affect us um, in this one-to-one -one with the institution. Yeah, um, I'm not doing a. Does it work? I'm not doing a Michael Landy here. You know, it's not. It's not. It's not about destroying and shredding. Um, it's. It's looking at what's here. And, and, and who would want to reuse it in which form? There might, there might be leftovers. I'm not quite sure yet what to do with the leftovers. Um, but a lot of the objects here have quite a fluid status anyway. You know, they can be furniture and installation. And I think that's what's going to be interesting in the next few weeks, how they dissolve. You know, are the drinks just going to disappear as drinks, which, <laughs> you know, is the most probably predictable outcome? But might the vitrine of uh, a company drinks um, reach a status of art here that might allow the Museum of London to purchase it for their collection? Um, so there is a there's a um, redistribution, um, of course, but also making use of the fact that things can be marked as art here. You know, and it's not me giving away things I use and own with others. Uh, this vitrine um, that's been discussed, you know, it's like, going to take the vitrine to the showroom, shall we sell it? And everyone's like, no, of course not, it's a really nice vitrine, we use it. I'm like, okay, if we can sell it for eight and a half thousand pounds, shall we sell it? It was like, yeah, of course, <laughs> you know. So um, I don't know, no one might want to buy this, and then it goes as a, back as a vitrine. But that, that's, and it's not, it's not all about financial transactions, you know, the, the posters, um, and, and that's a work that's been going on for many years. It's this idea that I like aesthetics. You know, I come from this background of hard edge paintings. I still like working with like shapes and stuff, but just not within the context of painting. And that's how the posters are offered here. Um, so uh, it's it's about aesthetic choices. You can make a wall piece. You can take it as as, as, as wrapping paper, and that's how it might dissolve. You know, the, the paper because paper is of use. Um, some of them are framed, they might become an addition. Um, but that's something I can't fully predict. I can just, the space is set up so that the things can dissolve and redistribute through different negotiations and into different spaces. Um, if anyone, if anyone needs a really big tractor tire, <laughs> one off opportunity to get one. Um, yeah, but. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the work has uh, ele ha always had elements of trade, you know. So objects, this fluidity, this fluidity of objects, I, I really enjoy. You know, something can be super precious and on the wall, and it, it can go and be, be given away for free. And I think that this playing, this 
uh, making use of it based on the interest you have in the object that really interests me rather than predicting how you can trade or use it but this this playfulness this kind of setting your own terms um, and decide why you want to take something home or not home And that will, that will unfold over the coming weeks. We'll see how, yeah. But yeah, it's not, it's not a shredding. It's not a getting rid of things. You know, I, I meet Wapke on Thursday. We will very carefully talk about what we do with all my villages, items that are in London. They're, they're not for trashing. They're, they're extremely valuable. Um, it's just um, maybe to reorganize them so they, they are getting used better in the future. Yeah. I've got another question for, for Mick from the audience, which is, um, how can we think through composting as a methodology for the para-curatorial in an effort to move beyond the exhibition as the primary medium through which art is valorized or valued? Um, thanks. I, I, I'm conscious that the earlier question on, you know, how do we realize alternative systems of value that I, I didn't respond, but I mean, I think <laughs> one of the things that I should confess is that I've, al I've always felt weirdly uncomfortable with the composting analog metaphor figure. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've worked with it and gone with it, but it's, I guess I'm a city boy. I don't, <laughs> city boy with that an allotment. <laughs> but, uh, the, um, so I, I guess one of the things I think about this question is that I, I think that the the thing that has been a learning for me in this whole process is to just get beyond the sense that we already know what the exhibition is, that we already know the for just these forms that we're habituated to, that something about that being habituated to them involves a particularly kind of dense opacity you know that that we don't attend we don't see and we don't think it through properly and i think so i i don't think the exhibition is the is the you know is a bad monolithic thing i think the exhibition is a particularly dynamic cultural form relatively recent as a genre of cultural practice not specific or limited to the art system, but but has a multiplicity. I, I I mean, in the in the journal issue, there's a beautiful contribution by Dave Beach that really excavates some aspects of this. Um. Th so I I would say that the the task is not to kind of how do we abandon the exhibition, but rather the task is to think through the specificities of different modes of exhibitionary practice and attend to their dynamics and understand them as still mobile as not fixed and finalized as still moving and i think like if we think of one genre the the biennial i mean it's really clear that this is a, a very kind of mobile model and it, it it hasn't frozen in a form there are certain kind of conventional aspects of the genre but there's also a lot of shifts and changes in terms of like the Liverpool biennial getting into durational public programming you know there's 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 things happening if I if I were to maybe refocus the question and say in what way might Catherine's specific implementation within the context of the showroom of this composting kind of figure, what might there be to be taken from that in relation to questions of curatorial strategies? I think one of the key things is the, the processes of co-production, not as a kind of romanticization of collectivity, but co-production as the already given condition of any cultural process, but the degrees to which that co-production is brought into kind of clear articulation and clear scrutiny and, and looked at as the condition of possibility of any cultural practice. So I, 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 I don't want to get into a dichotomy of exhibition good, exhibition bad, but I do think there is something about notions of the curatorial 
that can be kind of um, accessed through thinking through the specifics of the way in which co-productive processes are, uh, are enacted and produced within this particular apparatus in the showroom that's unfolding over the coming weeks. And it's, I guess it's, it's an opening up of that to all of those who enter into the space that we'll see over the coming, over the coming weeks. Well, well some, some will be revealed and others will remain just one-to-one -one between Catherine, yourself, and whoever you're speaking with at, at that moment. But entirely make the idea that, that, that co-production is, is already the condition within which you're, you're working or, the, or that, we all, that we all are as a starting point. Yeah. And maybe this is a good moment. I think we're just on the cusp of opening up the space to opening up also everyone's mutes so that whoever else is in the room with us today could also be present, both with sound as well as their images. Um, but unless anyone, or Catherine, you had any fi final words that you wanted to bring to the conversation today, or also Nick or Joyti. Joyti's left us but Nick's with us still <laughs> um, at this moment. No, I just, uh, it's funny, the, the word that I've heard more than any other in the past hour and a half is unfolding. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, I'm imagining I'm not there, but I'm imagining there's lots of folds in all the different bits of paper <laughs> and over the course of the next few weeks, there'll be perpetual unfolding. But no, just as a huge uh, thank you, I hope somehow to be able to get to London to speak to Catherine and see this and unfold together. <laughs> but thank you. Um, in the chat, we po yeah, posted the, po the, the means in which anyone who's not able to come physically to the showroom is able to join online. So there's many different access points through the PASS website, through the showrooms, but through the new compost website that Harry uh, and Ender Supply has been incredibly building these past weeks, so that's live also. So, and that's where the kind of actually the most live um, information about what's going on in the space or who is here at any given time and what they're doing is visible. So the compost website is really the, the go-to. Um, and after this event, the recording will be uploaded so that it'll be possible to revisit after today. So... I think without also further ado, we can open up at this point and just to say thank you again for everyone who's attended today online and joined us. And we're really looking forward to this next kind of short window of time just to all be together in this like relative mode of collectivity online and physically here at the showroom today. So thanks so much. And I just just unmute yourself if you if you feel it, and then just we can just shift into this mode where anyone can speak say something raise a voice say hi to Catherine as you wish <laughs> but thank you yes Seema's upstairs Seema can unpin the team yes mm -hmm. the the well the others who are all present with us today you yeah hear you? maybe Seema can hear us yes quickly say thank you so yes. much to you Lily Seema and the rest of the team that is there I'm sorry, I cannot be with you guys. Thank you, Catherine, as always, to allow this opportunity to also be vulnerable uh, in this public uh, ground. So we look forward to you. Catherine, I have a question for you. Yeah. You can hear me. <laughs> Well, I think you can now. Yeah, you yeah. can hear me. Did you yeah. use an art transporter to get everything to the show? What do you think? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ten points. <laughs> no, but of course, sometimes the work, I wouldn't, but sometimes the work gets taken to places in two different sets of transport. You know, the drinks mm. get taken get handled by art handlers, sent with whoever, expensive, and the same drinks get put on a pallet, and they go to the shop, but the others go to the exhibition. And I'm not say, I, I think be very careful with the objects you 
you want to keep, you know, all respect for this. But again, there's, an, there's a hidden economy be behind all of that, which I also think it's interesting re revealing, you know, like why. But yeah, no, it, uh, if anyone needs a really good van in London, um, call Dimitri. Again, I can put the number of them on the website. And did you do an inventory? Of, is there an inventory of things in the... That's what no. we're trying to do with the database, and I'm really not quite sure how far we're going to get and how much it actually makes sense. That's yeah. something I can't quite grasp yet, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I, can't, I, I can't... The only thing I really would like to keep are the books, you know, the books. Um, but I can't grasp... But that's why it's nice to have the physicality of the material. You know, to open one of those boxes, there's like 500 items in there. Do we just put them on the wall, take one photo? <laughs> mm. Or do we start scanning? And that's the decision-making process that's live and with Laura uh, in the space. I'm not quite sure yet. Mm. And the people, we, you know, there's always the, of course, you can categorize by the categories that are obvious. You know, like um, solo exhibition, group exhibition, uh, um, painting, poster. And we're we are doing this at the moment for, for quickness, but we're also doing it in the background that's invisible. We are setting up a, a different system to also un deconstruct this taxonomy of how objects should behave. Mm. Um, but that is completely in the making. I do judge them personally in the background. I give them marks <laughs> the work. Yeah, Catherine gives herself marks out of 10 for each. Yeah, then Wapke, who's in the room, yeah, Wapke, Wapke once said to me, like, if you do a really good project every 10 years, that, that's good. You know, if you, if you manage that as an artist, every 10 years, a really good project, that's actually quite an achievement. Um, and I, I keep this with me, also to not say I don't care the rest of the time, but that's, I think, also maybe the reality of, yeah, yeah. how often you can achieve stuff. So at the end of this show, you'll give it a mark <laughs> out of ten. Probably, we can do it. To, we can do it together. Your Euro European, Eurovision, no Europe, European compo. No, I stopped. Yeah. Honestly, I talked enough. I, I stopped now. But it's like it could shift over time. I'm interested. You know, if, like if you're creating this kind of ledger of, you know your own sense of the, the success or failure of a project at a particular point in time, but now revisiting and how that might shift, you know, as in, in any practice like day to day, it's always, it's this one to one scale of like the immediacy in the present where you feel about something in this way, but looking back how to, yeah, how, how you'll revalue past projects, tying into this question of how we're valuing the work. Yeah. We're shifting into a sort of Q&A mode again when it's actually <laughs> just a kind of opening up to, to everyone. But someone was asking, will your compost be a pros? You know, there's also a bit of a decision at this stage in my career whether you either have a mid-career survey or compost. And I'm much happier with a compost. Hi Rose, and who's that with you, Rose? Say hey. Hi. 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 <laughs> That's nice to meet you on this long distance call. It is Potter Svenska. It is speak Swedish. Men, who can talk English also? Let's see. Do we have something Swedish? Have we got anything Swedish on the compost that we can bring? <laughs> Quickly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not going to turn into comedy mode now. I won't. No, no, no. I will not. Compare. No, but we, we have been talking about who everybody is and where people are based and how Zoom as a format is it's a super nice way for lots of people to be able to speak and share things that might not normally be able to get together. So thank you very much for the invitation and we've enjoyed our evening.
dinner and watching some art discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here with us. It's, it's true, it's what's enabled by, by the digital and this switch between the physical and the online. Yeah, I mean, the, the stress of getting the microphone set up, I mean, like, you know, but we didn't have the stress of booking lots of flights and trying for everybody to be here at the same time. So that, that was actually a nice not having that stress, no? Like trying to think, how many people can we afford to bring to the showroom? <laughs> um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and the obvious kind of question around sustainability within that of a refusal, which, you know, we might take forward anyway, or we should take forward, nevertheless, from in terms of like the, from the showroom's perspective around travel or like how we continue from this point thinking, taking seriously the questions that have come up as part of this process, which, you know, we could start with the way in which we were reusing the material that was available in the building to build the support stru shelving structures for compost, but that's a kind of the tip of the iceberg um, yeah. in terms of really, yeah, like really taking seriously how we shift our practices within as an organisation, but I think that's, like you're saying, it's like in the act of doing, we are starting to institute that together, like between Elvira, Seema, myself, with you, Catherine, with the whole team. Like I think in the act of doing, you already start the process. And so, but it's it's about taking the the kind of micro things, the small the details that come up day to day, and then how to think about that long term, or put it into like think about translate it into infrastructure, rather than just circumstances of the here and now. That shift, but maybe that's the thing, the shift between the one-to-one -one, the immediacy to the thinking about a long-term plan mm -hmm. or like this long-term infrastructural shift, which is a question because, yeah, we're going to have to work through it. But Yeah. No, I, I, I would, I think the ambition is that the, the fertilizer that comes out of it will be clear and useful. But it would be really not a good idea on day one to talk about what it might be. No. Give, give it a bit of time. Yeah. I so need a drink. <laughs> I think it's time. But yeah, maybe if it's um. We can. I. I coming to the can, end. Can we Yeah. We can unmute everybody. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Shall I, shall I show you the thing that we have that makes everybody laugh? Yeah. Right, yeah. this might not work now. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a joke and it's going to be funny. Oh, oh, I'm going to have to scrap it. Are they the big, big songs? Were they tie dye? Yeah. I shouldn't really show them off because they're not mine. They're part of Keep It Complex. But yeah, they're uh, 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 tie dyed um, period pants. And yeah, they're uh -huh. very good objects to start conversations. But that's not mine. That's Keep It Complex. And in a way, I shouldn't have used it because we don't really use the objects anymore without collective reflection. Uh, where we come from? <laughs> it's good you can make it at home. Super simple. Just get some red dye and put your pants in. John, John is dyeing his hair right now. Purple. Yeah, purple is good as well. Ah. Yeah, see, my hair color went wrong. I thought it would be blonde. It's orange. <laughs> Yeah, we have like what's, what, what we couldn't do today because it was too noisy. The showroom has this amazing huge shutter. It has the biggest gallery door in the universe. Like, Should we open it up? Four meters by six meters. And we didn't have it open just because it was too loud. But of course, that's one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest assets also to make compost public because um, it's just you walk, you walk into it. Um, I don't think you can see it on Zoom. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And for those who are not in London, it is summer. 
Yeah, so that's pretty swish. Like, I would recommend this for any gallery. I don't see everyone. I see Viviana. Hello. Hello. Persilia, there's also a lot of Persilia. Hi. We've talked about this compost a um, few years ago. There has also been a lot of support from a lot of colleagues to, to prepare and think it through. Ah. Getting used to that. Dave, nice to see you. I hope to see you at the at the pile. <laughs> yeah, I don't see. No. Ah, there's Laura. Laura, you want to say something about our, our Saturday? I think. Um, what do you think? Um, I think we're getting there, yeah. We just started. It's very overwhelming, but it's very exciting at the same time. And yeah, uh, I think unfolding is pretty much a word for describing uh, the project. And. Yeah, it would be very interesting to uh, disrupt uh, taxonomies uh, in terms of archiving and uh, to shape uh, an archiving methodology in relation to your ideas and your practice, uh, questioning the archiving methodologies as you're questioning your um, practice and uh, the exhibition space context itself. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's also a conversation, Mick, I can't see you right now, but we had early on, you know, like when we talked about the book and the chapters and what kind of language to use, and then also to maybe stick with a certain clear language, not, not disrupting all the language around it, also to keep it recognizable mm -hmm. for those who were part of it or are part of it. Um, so. I, that's at least within the editorial discussions that, that that's 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 one thing where we're quite certain that we want to keep the language around the practice relatively clear. Yeah, um, So not to like if if something is about uh, making making public space, maybe call it an architecture, call it public space, and to not use an obscure or too personalized language to make. The work then inaccessible, or to 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 think about it, make make that inaccessible. Um, yeah, but I, I'm sure Mick would uh, say this in a much more elegant way. That's very kind of you, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Is it time for a drink? I think time for an end. We've come to 6.30, so this is the end of our time in terms of we're gonna what we be said we would do. So we stick to what we say we would do and now shift to the totally in real life rather than the digital and the yeah. real life. Yeah. We'll, ha we'll have a drop in Zoom once a week. Let's see how that goes. Um, but yeah, please um, come here or be in touch. Um, there's different ways of sipping through, even with a distance. Okay, well, that's all. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you so much.